The showrunners of The Office are getting all their angst of replacing Steve Carell out in one episode. We need a new manager. That's right. Today we are talking about season seven finale of The Office, The Search Committee, written by Paul Lieberstein and directed by Jeff Blitz. Search Committee is a star strutted jammed pack episode of The Office, dealing with the committee's search for a long term replacement for D'Angelo after his terrible, terrible day. We have a ton to talk about, including the meta layer of this episode and its deeper meaning. And we'll get to some fun stuff along the way. So with that, let's go. I understand nothing. With this being an hour long episode, there's actually a ton of stuff crammed into it. If you haven't watched the search committee episode lately, maybe give this video a pause and go give the episode a watch. Uh, for this portion, I think I want to break down the converging stories by chunking them out one by one rather than just running through that hour sequentially. So first up is the overall setup of the episode. Bo body, Bo body. What does the first B stand for? Creed is now running the shop after this interaction in the last episode. Now, who's got the most experience in this office? Uh, well, we probably don't want to go just on seniority. Who is it? As I like to call it, Great Bratton. Keep it running. Meaning that now the rogue element is ultimately responsible for everyone in the office and Dunder Mifflin's future, which the cold open clearly establishes why this is a short-term arrangement. Personally, care. The episode further cements why Creed would be a terrible boss. I've got some bad news. We're going out of business. Saving face. And from that, the side plot develops in which Pam has to protect the branch from any consequences resulting from the Creed regime. This gives Fisher some fun things to do throughout the runtime of this episode. A lot of that was cut, and I've always enjoyed her performance in this. Things about paper. Hey, are you single? This seems like a love connection to me. Another plot running the length of this episode is a series step forward for the character of Angela Martin. Then he got down on one knee and he said, will you be a senator's wife? This sparks the gossip train to run wild on the sexual preference of the senator, something that while everyone in the office basically concludes as fact, they all decide to keep their secrets. But the real meat and potatoes of the search committee episode is the search committee, which is a tribunal composed of the head of sales, the only guy to turn Joe down, the HR department, the writer of this episode, and Gabe. No further thing. The episode does a fantastic job of balancing out the interviewees, various plot lines with the interviewers. Each of the tribunal have their own motives. Something edited out almost entirely from the Netflix cut of this episode is Toby's desire to worm his way into a manager position. Are you trying to tell me you should be manager? No, no. I, I am. I'm just saying if we can't find someone, yeah, sure, I'd do it. Gabe, super corporate as he is, is motivated seemingly just to ensure that Andy doesn't get the job. Shut up about the sun! And I kind of wish he succeeded, but sorry. Jim just seems like he wants to do the right thing with the least amount of stress and blowback from the office as possible, something that by now he should just be confident is not possible. Little advice, take a day off from the whole Jim shtick. Try caring about something. You might like how it feels, James. Later in the episode, Gabe's bizarre behavior is outed by a scorned Kelly. We're going to get to that in a minute. So he is then later replaced by Kelly on the search committee. Um, why Kelly? Because Gabe's tall and weak, she's short and strong. I'm doing an opposites thing. And with that, the big development here is that Gabe's position is changing, meaning he's going to be splitting his time between Pennsylvania and Florida. No, but you don't need to make that sound. I'm sorry, you were just a lot bonier than I thought you were going to be. There are plenty of people who love touching me. But then we'll shift over to the interviewees. They are the main bits that compose this episode. And they're split between potential inside hires and potential outside hires. Uh, let's look at the Annie's first. Starting with Andy, he puts his name into the running in the same way that, you know, one might run for class president. I'm educated, I'm capable, I like all of you, and I won't make any changes. Andy does seem to get that winning the hearts and the minds of the people could have a huge sway over the search committee. Would a small penis work? He's hanging up adverts, printing buttons, and while his confidence level is clearly an issue, he brings his A game to the interview. However, based on the past he has with Gabe, that interview doesn't quite pan out in the way that he would have preferred. I am unhappy 
with the confusing and at times confrontational nature of that meeting. I wanted it to go better. I wanted it to go better! Andy scene's still dealing with his anger management, something I love about this episode. And this is definitely the kind of thing that they teach you in those types of classes. Calmly separate yourself from other people and run through in your mind or out loud what expectations you had that were not met. Normally, Andy's anger problem is a source of jokes and maybe some drama here and there, but this always merits just a little bit of empathy from me. Their genius plan, I'm sure. Andy's interview has this B-plot of its own, by the way. It's like a nested B-plot in which Aaron is flirting with the candidate all throughout the day. Just like in the last episode, Kemper does really well. She gets this line. I see it. I see it like I see a mountain that I'm standing in front of and facing. And I'm like... It's funny. It's over the top. But that little subtle break in her voice, it it feels so real and I love it. Next up for the innies is Daryl, the best friend to Andy and the candidate of choice for much of the office. Thing is, Daryl's coming in from a blue collar background, meaning his experience in interviews are probably much more relaxed and personality based sessions just to see if there's a good vibe coming from a candidate like do I really want to work with this type of person? In that way, he's killing it. I mean, you don't see a bear drinking raccoon milk. How long have you been off dairy? As soon as I can say no to those two pushes, Ben and Jerry. Oh. <laughs> but once the white collar tribunal starts up, Daryl's still kind of out in the blue. That was a pun. <laughs> You're funny. This one misstep seems to have completely derailed him for the day, and it's painful to watch. The rest of this episode, he's just slightly off key. He creates a resume but it has four pages instead of the typical one pager, which I know there's probably a lot of variants out there for how we do resumes and that probably varies from job to job. That's the idea of why Joe's making a big deal of his resume. It was there, but it was just a little off. It didn't meet her expectations. There's even a little fantastic commentary on the kind of things that we put in our resumes, by the way. For 2.5 billion units of inventory. 2.5 billion units of what? Pieces of paper. But Daryl makes several insecure cues throughout the day, all of which seem to be having an impact on the main tribunal head. And then this moment completely wipes Daryl off the radar. I don't know if he'd be a good manager, but he's a really great dad. So I get it, but like the look that Jim shoots Daryl is almost one of being completely mortified. And I'm not sure if I'm missing something here. I Obviously, it's completely unprofessional to send your kid into your office place to you know, work over and manipulate everyone with their cuteness. But it seems like, I don't know, this is maybe harsher than it needs to be. Thoughts in the comments. Speaking of Jim being harsher than he needs to be, though, is the next potential hire, and it's Dwight True. Originally over Dunder Mifflin at the start of this episode, Dwight does get fired up upon seeing Robert California, who we're going to talk about in a minute, talk trash on the branch that Dwight loves. This ignites the guy, and he makes his play to Jim. The hand that reaches from the grave to grip your throat is the strong hand you want on the wheel. Okay, that's vivid. And to Joe, when she arrives later in the day, he's texting me his resume one line at a time. These are costing me 10 cents a piece, you jackass. I'm roaming. And yet again, it is fraudulent costumed attempt at an interview. It's me. I'm Dwight. No. Oh, wait, but I mean, you're Dwight and then he's the... We just take a minute to give Dwight the credit of seeding in his own deeper meaning with that name. Jacques is like a French version of Jacob, which according to the Hebrew Bible meant he who supplants. And souvenir, or how we say it on this side of the pond, souvenir, is like a memento, a thing that's kept because it has meaning or it's a reminder of a place, a person or an event. So Dwight's name for this fictitious character is trying to use his shrewd deception to hold on to this thing that is so special to him. Literally means I'm going to sneak this special thing out from under you. Then what? I would address this way every day, legally change my name, learn French sign language, shown up and been the best damn branch manager you'd ever seen. I love it. It fails, obviously. That's f***ing crazy. But it's a great bit, and it's enough to win back the admiration from Joe. And give Dwight an interview. I like a little bit of crazy. And then later we get an interview with Dwight, and Rain Wilson is working both parts of this fantastically. Uh, seriously, utmost respect for this bit. I think it's an underappreciated moment across all of the office as a whole. How are we ever to trust you again? 
That's a great question. Kelly's also interviewed for the position, capitalizing on the minority junior executive training she received earlier this season. You guys, I'm like really smart now. You don't even know. But it feels like there wasn't really much here except to give her a reason to be vindictive about Gabe later. As minority executive, I think it's my responsibility to let you know that Gabe is gross. Taking a look at the Audis, we're gonna start with Warren Buffett. Who's that? So Buffett is, if you don't know, a super wealthy guy who owns a bunch of stuff, including a major real estate company. And I read that Buffett had an annual conference that he did for his company, and they would do this brief comical video each year. So it just so happened that the Buffett camp had reached out to NBC to see if they could work some way to have Buffett on set of The Office to shoot a video for that conference. And the showrunners had the idea then to include Warren Buffett in the search committee episode kind of last minute, so much so that all of this dialogue is supposedly unscripted, just kind of improv. And Buffett is known, by the way, for being a pretty frugal guy, despite how wealthy he is. When I make long distance calls, will they be monitored or is it on the honor system? Another cameo comes from Ricky G or David Brent from the UK version of The Office. And we know from a few weeks back that this guy was looking for a job in the US. Any jobs going? No, not right now. Just let me know. All right, see you around. Yeah. And this reprisal of the Brent character is pretty great. Though, personally speaking, I do wish that there was a bit more interaction between these characters. Ipso facto, women too. When do I start? Yeah. Catherine Tate, on the other hand, was brought into play Nellie Bertram, one of Joe's acquaintances. So, which, I'll be honest, it's kind of weird that she knows two human beings who are willing to move to a little Pennsylvania mountain town to work as a regional manager for a mid-tier paper company. Unfortunately or not, we're going to be talking a lot more about Nellie this year. So stop looking at my breasts and start looking at my penis. But for now... Her extended interview is full of pivots, and all of this does feel very corporate-y for a couple different reasons. I'll take down the cubicle walls, scratch everything from before, I'll tell you what I'd do. Go the other way. More cubicles. I think yeah. that's probably all you need to hear from Zen time. office. Everyone takes their shoes off before they come in. <clears throat> office of the future. Like the inside of a virgin airplane. Telecommuting, right? Everyone's at home. The office is just a big empty space. It's just full of screens. Tate is kind of a big deal from Doctor Who, something that, especially at the time, I don't think a majority of Americans were familiar with at all. So she was an ideal candidate to parade on screen to see how she might perform. You know, uh, she also gave me reason to think that maybe she wasn't a good fit. Well, I'm not saying you must hire her. And speaking of that, then there's James freaking Spader. There is only sex. Spader was a huge deal in the 80s. I first saw Spader when I begged my parents to let me go see Stargate in 1994 in the movie theaters. Nerd, that is why you're not on the team. But then I saw him again in an episode of Seinfeld. Basically, he kind of just bounced around a lot from the mid 90s to the mid 2000s until he got a job on Boston Legal. A couple years later, he was on The Office. From The Office, he landed a lead antagonist role in the Avengers sequel and starred in a series called Blacklist, which I've watched over my wife's shoulders a few times. And you know, I think he's kind of still playing Robert California. Spader was a big pull for The Office in some ways, but at this point, it was merely a cameo. There was no certainty on whether he would return or not. In fact, they didn't even extend a contract his way until off season. <laughs> I will get offered the job. That's a call I've received many times. I suspect his contract is the same reason we never see or hear from Jordan again, by the way. California's take on the interview process is amazing to spectate. He is in absolute control he knows it and he's full of confidence he's reading these people he's saying all of the right things kind of best of all out of all of the candidates he directly acknowledges the camera in which no one else does he has such presence about him it is up to the object whether it will be flattened or not. And I can tell just from the small interaction we've had already, you won't be flattened by anybody. The ability to steamroll someone and then convince them that they are allowing this to happen is the corporate experience. It's what brings Robert California to life for me. It's a character of someone that I'm assuming we all know in the business world. Do you agree with me, Jim? Yes. Yes, you do. Past that is a round of cameos that we're just going to call 
Steve Carell's friends. We've got Will Arnett, who had quite a successful career with his work in Arrested Development, and then later the Lego Batman. Well, it's an interview, and we don't know that you really have the plan. plan well, I'm not gonna just make up that I have a plan. I, I got a plan, believe me, you guys want it. You're in paper, right? And let's talk about this interview for just a second. What is the protocol for this? I've been a part of some pretty grueling interview processes in my life, and I've never had anyone blatantly ask me for the details on a specific plan I would take in a role. Most of the time it's generalities, and detailed enough to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. And I would assume that if you're interviewing for higher and higher positions, especially like C-level positions, then yes, you need to demonstrate that your plan is in line with the company's agenda. But I just think it's kind of weird to have a branch manager of a small paper company walk through their entire plan for success in the interview. I don't know. I feel like I kind of side with Will Arnett there, but maybe I'm in the minority. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. What is happening right now? The comedian cameos round out further with Ray Romano, whose long-standing sitcom Everyone Loves Raymond would imply that The Office was looking for another comedic lead on Carell's level. And then they shoehorned in Jim Carrey, who probably just took this cameo as a favor to someone behind the scenes. Finger lakes, finger lakes, finger lakes. But this is the segue to the meta layer and the deeper meaning of this episode, and it's probably therapy for just one single person. Interesting. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Season seven of The Office was a huge undertaking. Paul Lieberstein at this point had been running the show for years. The stress had been stretching him thin. It had to be. Not only was he tasked with steering the series through the dismissal of Steve Carell, but he had to make it good. So good that people would still want to watch The Office after he left, which that's huge. I mean, that's so complicated to actually be able to pull off. And I, like many of you, I often wondered, just could The Office still be good after Steve Carell left? Like, sometimes I'm still watching The Office now and I think, hmm, I wonder what I could have done different in the last two seasons of The Office. And that's nice because I get to go to my day job and make corporate goobly gop without so much as a second thought about it. But Lieberstein was living this life day in, day out as the showrunner of The Office. Not only his quote nine to five, which I'm sure were not the hours he was keeping in The Office during the seasons, but it also had to be a thing that kept the guy up at night. Because not only was he trying to create something amazing, but this is also his career on the line. Big success might equal new opportunities in the future, big failure might result in everyone pointing the blame on him. This stress level and the amount of work that was involved in making the show is probably why they also decided to fade him out earlier in the season the way they did. Having Holly take his place gave Lieberstein some time during the day to focus on running the show, a show that everyone was predicting was just about to run aground. SHUT UP ABOUT THE SUN! who is going to replace Steve Carell after he leaves the office? That was the million dollar question. For all the character development, all of the hooks into existing characters, and the tireless work that kept the quality of the series as high as they could make it, none of it mattered, except who is replacing Steve Carell? And I think Search Committee was not only intended to be a Who Killed Mr. Burns-esque cliffhanger season finale for The Office's biggest season, it was a chance for Lieberstein to explore the world that he's been living in for the last year. Should he cast one of the existing Office's characters into the manager seat? What implications would reveal themselves if so? Let's say you go with Dwight. Where does Dwight's despotic leadership end? <laughs> We don't have to worry because they already explored that. Probably wouldn't or couldn't put Mindy Kaling as a lead character, as I'm not sure she had the star power and the street cred to back that up, but also she was a lead writer for the show. Am I not a serious candidate? What do you want me to say? Further, they hadn't really gone out of their way to establish much depth for the character year after year, meaning that followed to its logical conclusion, every joke would have been. You seem kind of hysterical to me. And I'm not sure there's a lot to work with there as a franchise character. Daryl is a character that I'm not 100% sure why they didn't decide to expand on. I was really invested in the screen time Daryl was getting and I hated to see him plateau throughout these seasons. And that leaves us then with Andy, and we're gonna get there in a minute. Well, I don't want to brag, but I did my best. With all the speculation on who would take over the manager's seat, though, another key aspect was explored by the show and bloggers at the time was, 
maybe another sitcom lead might be a good fit, with Will Ferrell brought in to bridge the gap and guest star roles filled with huge actors, the show could get a little bit weird with who they might consider for the job. I'm gonna prevent inferior men from sullying my place of work with their weak, passionless leadership. And I doubt any long-term casting decisions were actually considered behind the scenes, so cameos in the search committee were probably much more therapeutic for people behind the scenes. Jim Carrey just walked in, Dwight, get his autograph from Michael. Jim Carrey did not just yes, walk he... in, okay? Finger Lakes guy's good. And from what we know now, there weren't many long-term casting decisions that were actually considered. So the cameos in the search committee are actually more like statements to the audience, to the networks, and the critics. A statement of, hey, it'd be weird to see famous people take over the manager's seat. No one can actually replace Steve Carell. No one can replace Michael Scott. Seeing Warren Buffett, Will Arnett, Ray Romano, Jim Carrey on screen is jarring. It's a nod to all of us that, hey, we heard your speculation, but no. You don't. You don't. Now I say all of that, and I know that James Spader would then get a contract, but I contend that that was solely due to his very compelling presence in this episode. Hopefulness in their voice, the pregnant pause while they wait to hear my response. We're gonna talk about him a lot more as we go forward, as for now, Search Committee's writing seems to be really rooted in that meta layer of the experience of both losing an extremely talented actor and an incredibly good character in the show. And all of the plot points in this episode reflect what's been happening behind the scenes of The Office. The urgency. We need a new manager. The studio involvement. Um, why, Kelly? Because Gabe's tall and weak, she's short and strong. I'm doing an opposites thing. No more manager turnover. Don't mess this up, Jim. The infighting. What the hell happened out there? There's even a random shot at the fandom. Well, what do I want in a manager? Let me see. What do I want? Everyone is listening to me. And with that, The Office's biggest season wraps on a cliffhanger. Exhausted, jaded, and ready for that break. Let's rate this thing. This is the worst. Guys, I don't want to labor this. I love this episode. I, the stunt casting is a bit jarring. We jumped the shark a long time ago, so why not have fun with it? And I'm fine with that. But starting with a cold opening. Phyllis, Jim, Ted, Elroy. And this side of the room, Pam, Meredith, Phyllis, Creed, he never called a meeting. Five out of five. I only want more of this, which is a sign of a good bit. As for the episode, well, I want to say that the edit that's on Netflix wasn't as long as the cut that we got on the DVDs or what's currently on Peacock. And I could be wrong about that, but there's a lot of stuff in this that I do not remember at all. You don't. And I've already dropped a lot of that in this video very much on purpose because I don't think I've ever seen it before. So I'll say this, I think that the longer cut of this episode suffers just a bit due to the pacing, but I don't remember that being a thing when watching the Netflix cut or even sitting there the night it aired. Overall, Search Committee has everything I like. This corporate culture commentary. Bread is the paper of the food industry. You write your sandwich on it. At least a couple great Kevin moments. Weird relationship drama. Where'd you learn how to puppet like that? Ryan casually stealing money from Kelly and a fantastic meme template. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. Five out of five, I love it. By the way, didn't Andy's housekeeper die? If you want something, you write it on a list and then the housekeeper goes out and gets it on Wednesdays and Fridays. I don't know, I guess you could say this job is on my list and we'll see what Rosa comes back with. And that's all I have to say about the search committee. Join me next time. We're going to talk about all of season seven in our season seven of The Office wrap up. It's going to be a trip. And from there, we're going to be smooth sailing into season eight. So thanks for sticking it out with me. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.